Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Friday evening, joined by Dr. Matthew Minard, who is continuing his lectures on the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we are doing uh, lectures here on the first part of the second part. And what do we have to look forward to today, Dr. Minard? And also, by the way, welcome again to the show. It's good to be here. And so tonight you've got the mostly the treatise on human acts in the first part of the second part. Although, you know, I, I had to put my my hand like this. We were b behind scenes in the green room and yeah. Michael was talking a little bit. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm not lecturing on the Nouvelle Theologie tonight. Now, <laughs> I knew that I had prepped today to think through this, but I had been just talking to someone about the Nouvelle stuff, a friend of mine from graduate school and I were having a long conversation. And I just, I, you know, I just got into kind of a rut. Uh, it's a Friday. It's a Friday. We're all kind of tired. So but I find it, you know, interesting that you're able to transition that quickly and do a lecture off the cuff like that. That's very impressive. <laughs> well, luckily, luckily I have, I, I, you know, I've got a, a text that I'm working on, uh, for hopefully publication just with uh well i shouldn't say with home but a uh, set of translations with an intro where i did a lot of stuff on treatise on human acts in it so yeah. i have a i have a like a rut of source i can get onto that i've been thinking about for some years actually because this is tied into all these questions on like the nature of conscience and how yeah. theology developed around the treatise on conscience and all that so it's it's actually something at least close enough at hand that like there's a bank of neurons that are waiting to to come back online <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah it's great to be well, here. I mean it's always yeah, it's, I'm, on, I'm here on the other side of Scott Hahn. I'm like the bookends of Dr. Hahn. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, he he was you were on the day before, then Dr. Hahn, and then and then yourself. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, yeah. To be, to be the bookends on so nice of a bookshelf is such a nice thing. So <laughs> well, and you have um a book we're gonna be discussing uh pretty soon. Yeah, we're finally going to do an order, uh, order of things. Yeah. We're going to talk about the content yeah. of that. I think maybe next week or the week after. I can't remember when. Right. My calendar right. tells me when. My calendar tells me when. Which is another <laughs> well, I do have it on, on the I website. Well, you know, if I didn't keep it up, uh, keep up with it on a calendar, I would I would forget at this point. There's just so much going on and so many shows. But they're, yeah, they're yeah. at the Reason and Theology website if y'all want to check out the calendar there. Yeah, you guys. I mean, you guys are really busy. It's like my we're, wife, we're we're doing stuff nearly every day at this point. So <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you have to do that. Like whenever yeah. my wife and I first started dating, we were living in. She was living in Pennsylvania, and I was living in Washington D.C. And we were doing the drive on the weekends while I was mm -hmm. still in grad school. Um, yeah. And like, just keep your mind straight. Like, which day I could leave and come back, and who was coming which direction to see each other. You know. That's um, rough, though. That is rough. How far what, of a drive was that? Oh, it's just about three hours. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. All, that's all highway. My mm -hmm. my little my. We were talking behind the scenes. I was making fun of my my little Nissan. My wife has the nice car. I just have this little Nissan Versa. Yeah. Uh, that thing got forty miles to a gallon back then, all on highway. So it was just wow. a zip. That's it's not one, bad. It's not one bad point at all. engine, just like a go kart going up over the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it now, <laughs> like a Mario Kart. <laughs> I, I do all this translation work at home, and then for the seminary, I don't have to drive into Pittsburgh a ton, so my car doesn't get much mileage at all. But boy, right. COVID, two hundred miles, like since Christmas, it's like yeah. nothing. So yeah, oh well, yeah, I'm usually here. I mean, I work, I work at home, and then I do all this, you know, here. I mean, the house is. 100 feet over there so i mean i do pretty much everything you know all in, in one location so i don't get out much anymore <laughs> i don't yeah, really I mean, have a need to <laughs> it's like yeah it's like my house is it's like right there and yeah. it could get a little bit closer if that termite damage manages to make it sink. <laughs> like, it's oh, it's worth it. so let's hope that the contractors right. get back to me with a quote right. i wish they would watch my stuff and tell me um all right, enough banter. Banter's important, though. Banter's important, people. It is. It is. You know, it keeps us it keeps us grounded. It keeps us from repeating last things, right? At, at human. That's life. true. So, so you want me to go ahead and just? Yeah, go ahead. Take it away. All right. The treatise on human acts. Boy, that sounds like something almost tedious, right? What is the treatise on human acts? Okay. 
So let's remember just structurally, because it's been a little while, right? We've been almost a month since we've talked about uh, St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae. Um, and so our last lecture was on the Treatise on Beatitude, those first essential, central uh, articles, uh, five, just five little articles uh, at the beginning of the first part of the moral part of the Summa. So it's sometimes called the first part of the second part, uh, right? It's it, it gets overwhelming, but it's uh, the general principles of moral uh, theology. Uh, St. Thomas transitions after talking about the Prima Secundae into talking about uh, moral theology. He'll then pick up Christology, eventually the seeds of what will become then Mariology and Ecclesiology and Sacramental Theology and the last things in the third part of the Summa. Not because he relegates Christ to a third portion, but because his particular notion of theology as a science requires him to have all these other discussions because he has to talk about the intra-Trinitarian life and then creation and then the elevation of the, cre the creature and providence and then all of everything about the moral life. So he has the vocabulary then to talk about uh, in a scientific way, Christ and hence Christology is there. But so the treatise on human acts is somewhat like, and it historically becomes this, a treatise on conscience. And I would argue, and it, it needs to be emphasized because it's not always clear in St. Thomas's text, it's a treatise on Christian conscience um, and the, the moral reasoning that goes on uh, in, in our coming to a, a full choice and an act. And actually the end of the treatise on human acts, uh, which uh, spans questions, uh, what, 6 to 21, should actually have that right in front of me and remember it, um, of the, I believe 21, of the Prima, prima Secundae, uh, ends, starting uh, late question 18 and then in 19, on the um, moral objects. So if you've ever read in the Summa Theologiae about the various, source, various sources of morality, um, you know, including the intention of an act, the circumstances of an act, the moral uh, moral object of an act. That's the tail end of the treatise on human acts. And that goes because it is uh, a little bit embarrassing. Yeah, it is to question 21. Um, so questions 18, 19, 20, 21 deal with how do we evaluate human acts? How do we say what's essential? What did someone do? What is the good act they did? What is the sinful act they did? Um, what are the circumstances? How do those play into the morality of the, of the human act? That's dealt with there. Now, when I say that it's a treatise on conscience, I know way too well that that's a simplification. So, boy, if you want to ask me questions afterwards, uh, I can go into some of that miserable history of the distinction between prudence and conscience. Um, but I'm going to put the two together because I want our, our overall outlook to be moving toward prudence and what most people call Conscience is close at hand to what, what the, the ancients would call phronesis or practical reasoning or moral practical reasoning. And especially for the Thomists, and we're going to discuss this in our next lecture, that would actually be the infused moral virtue of prudence, a kind of Christian prudence that we get as an emanation of our sac sanctifying grace that elevates our moral reasoning uh, so that we reason in a way as moral agents, as though we are children, uh, children of God, brothers of Christ, members of the mystical body of Christ. So, okay. So, interestingly, in the history of uh, moral theology, some odd things happened. And the treatise on Beatitude actually got lost. Um, if you were to, for instance, pull off of your shelf or look online, buy, and then put and then pull it off your shelf, the uh, moral theology of St. Alphonsus of Liguori, for instance, you would find at the head of moral theology, a treatise on the conscience and human acts. Um, and I'd have to go back and look right now to see exactly what his breakout is. But at the, at the very front end, the discussion of conscience begins to, to play a central role. It's outside the domain of the details that we can discuss here and that I'm prepared for, for dealing with in all of its just various overly um, scrupulous uh, details. But around the, what, around the 15, mid-1500s, 
there was a, a burgeoning debate in moral theology in the Catholic world. It's usually attributed to the Dominican Bartolomeo de Medina, but it just gets picked up in that era over how certain you have to be that what you're doing is right. What is the certitude that's required for you to know that you are not falling into sin and that you're actually doing a virtuous activity? Truth be told, I'm already making it sound better. Basically, the language was this. How much certitude do you need to know that the moral law holds, whether or not you know something is wrong or not? I, I joke with people that it was a question that reminds you of what you're like when you're a teenager, right? How far can I go with my girlfriend before sinning? Um, this debate came to be called the probabilism debate uh, because of the way that Bartolomeo de Medina and then others spoke about probability, the kind of the weighing of probabilities for and against what is uh, permissible. And various uh, approaches were taken and various sub-schools of moral theology developed where some people were called probabilists. The main line of most Dominicans though were called probabiliarists. You have to be more probable that something is uh, permissible whenever there's at least certain dangers attached to it. There were laxists who basically said, listen, as long as you've got some reason to think that it's okay, fine enough. Um, the Jesuits tended to be either probabilists or laxists, but it always seemed like the probabilists would always say this. If there's a doubt, it's probably the case then that, that it's permissible. Now that's simplifying it, right? But this gave birth to a whole genre of casuistry, studying particular cases of conscience to see just how, you know, you should analyze your actions to figure out whether or not you could do something. And moral theology became this, especially for seminary formation for a lot of folks. Um, I can't remember if it's Daniello de Concina, right? So it's, you know, once again, the reasons that could tempt you into, you know, day drinking uh, is, you know, all of these people that you wonder why in the world do you even know, you know, of, of them? I can't even remember them. But he was a Dominican uh, during these debates. And I think it was his theology text opens up with 600 pages or 700 pages of a discussion of conscience and pr the probabilism debates. And eventually what comes to be called like equiprobabilism, I think is already expressed in him, which is Alphonsus's tr attempt to, to cut through all of this. But the theologies of conscience becomes this calculus of moral actions that is unmoored from the treatise on beatitude because you're so concerned about cases of conscience you're concerned with what is the, the boundary of sin. You're concerned with particular actions, whether or not this act is right or wrong. Famously, and a few Mungus is on, uh, one of the listeners, he's going to maybe feel vindicated. This is the kind of moral theology that was railed against by Surveys Pinkers. Everyone talks about Father Pinkers as being the anti-manualist, the anti-casuist, the anti-probabilist, but truth be told, Garrigou Lagrange complained about this probabilism. Uh, Father Labordet, who, uh, about whom we've spoken, uh, if you've watched any of the lectures on the Nouvelle Theologie, he himself talks about how this probabilism, this concern for human actions as particular, just discrete things, this one action and try to figure out, okay, well, what is, is it right or wrong? this action, is it right or wrong? Is this act right or wrong? And just that, leaving the conversation there, he said, this turns everything into just a desiccating calculus. And it is a sort of strange rationalism. Well, we luckily, though, are not going to detach our discussion of human acts from the treatise on Beatitude. But in order to do this, I will admit that I'm going to be drawing on the treatise on virtues. Because we have to try to get an understanding for the various stages by which a, an action unfolds and then eventually does give birth to a particular action that we can judge. So it wasn't wrong that historically the treatise on conscience developed out of some of the discussions we had here. A little sub-treatise got added and then it ballooned into this big thing. But I've mentioned uh, in my other lectures, I think, Father Merkelbach. Father Merkelbach, I think, has the best approach to this, 
to try to put some discussion here. And then he says, put everything else in prudence. The virtue of prudence, which we'll discuss later, whenever we get to the second part of the second part, is, is the virtue by which our mind is rectified so that we can choose here and now for us in our particular circumstances, the truly virtuous path forward in line with the moral virtues. So it's our light for trying to find the way to go forward in virtue. Normally the way this is put is it's the, the virtue that um, rectifies moral reasoning so that we can choose the means for executing the ends of the moral virtues. So I'm pointing behind myself because it's like the ends are the light, the big light that we have to get down into a particular act. And very often different virtues are going to look, various virtues, even one in the same virtue is gonna look different for me, for Michael. We have different temperaments. We've got different uh, temptations that we can fall into. We've got different strengths and weaknesses of character and prudence is needed for executing that. So I think Merkelbach was very right to stick conscience there, even though also there's a misery of distinctions between uh, prudence and conscience as well. Okay, so let's think about human acts. The human person deep down inside, I would say from a Christian perspective, but most definitely from St. Thomas's perspective and the Thomas school's perspective, has an infinite thirst, really a kind of double thirst, uh, a, a natural thirst that opens up by the action of grace to a supernatural thirst. That we have a thirst for really in the end, nothing other than the vision of God. Now, that could be the vision of God only known through reason, which is very weak, or the vision of God and the love of God attained through the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and then in the hereafter, in the, in the vision of God. Um, directly attained beatifically. Now, that that leaves quite a bit of room for, for, for particular actions. How is this action today? How is me choosing to, to drink some tea, something that has a moral character that, that is related to that desire for beatitude? That's going to be the role of all the various virtues. But deep down inside, we have an end, and that's the important thing. To note here, we have an ultimate end. That's the purpose of the treatise on beatitude. And that end needs to be reflected in all of our particular acts. And that's why we need virtues in order to, to basically have the capacity for choosing those ends. And on top of it, in the supernatural order, we need the gift of the theological virtues and the infused moral virtues in order to attain our end. Moral reasoning is like the leaning toward those particular actions from intent, even before intention, from desire to action. So the stylistic way that this was presented, uh, somewhat in a, a kind of psychological chart, uh, which has been critiqued like everything else, what hasn't been critiqued by people like Pink Cares actually, um, but I think is still pretty sane, is to think of moral reasoning as happening and unfolding in three big steps that have some sub-steps in them. There's the order of ends, as it would be called, or the order of intention, or we could say the first leaning toward achieving a moral good. Then there is the order of trying to find the way forward and to judge the path we must take, which would also, we could uh, call the order of uh, means or the order of choice or the order of judgment or the activity of prudence. So we have the order of ends, the order of means, and then we have the execution of the act that we've chosen to do. Because the most important thing to do in moral reasoning is not to reason, but ultimately you have to command yourself to do it. You need to take Everything that you, you've weighed out and you need to actually become the rule and measure of your activity virtuously or if you fall into sin by vice. Prudence has to inform the will so that you do it. You have to do the damn action. Pardon my French. You can sit around. You
Dr. Monard, are you there? If y'all are able to hear us in the, uh, please let me know in the live chat. I want to see if it's my connection or Dr. Monard's. So if y'all can hear me, let me know. Y'all cannot hear Dr. Monard. Let me know. I'm working on it. Can you see me now? Oh, yep. I can hear you and see you now. Camera. So I don't know what happened. All right. Uh, Sorry sorry about that. Trouble. All right. Go ahead and. You got to go to battle is another way to put it. You've got to actually execute and do the action. So we've got intention, choice, execution is the way we can think of it. But let's begin. Well, let's actually back up one little bit because this is the, the magic of moral reasoning. It's not magic. It's the gift of God. And it's related to the theme of the natural law, which we'll discuss in a couple of weeks. We're not just called to to. to try to figure out the big truth table that God has in the heavens that like this one act is exactly what I want to do. I'm supposed to do like I'm the marionette that God is controlling. We of course are meant to conform our will to God and to what he has chosen as our, our path through life, but he has chosen to create us as rational beings. And so we are to fulfill our, our providential destiny as free agents There is a concourse between freedom and vocation in human action. And so for this reason, we participate in God's own providence. This is how St. Thomas talks about the natural law and also the law of grace. And there's a beautiful line in the encyclical Veritatis Splendor by uh, Pope St. John Paul II. And I believe it's actually taken from the works of Martin Ronheimer, actually, from what what I know where he refers to our moral agency as participated theonomy. Theonomy, theos being God, nomos being law. We participate in God's own law, whether through nature or through grace. That's what the activity of human action is. That's what the, the, the undertaking of, of human activity is. So, What's it like at the beginning, the budding of, of our reasoning? So let me tell you a little bit about the top of this chart. Right, we've got the three main steps. Top of this chart, as it's normally um, presented, is this. And then I'll give you what I think is a, a deeper way of, of reading it. And I've developed this based on my reading of Garigou Lagrange and Gardet and Simo- Yves Simone and Jacques Maritain. Um, but it's in line, I think, with the Thomas School. It helps to just open it up a little bit. You have to first, of course, grasp that there's something you can do. There's the old adage, you can't love something if you don't know it. Okay, it's true, but let's think through the implications of that. You have to think, and this is how it's normally presented, it would be good. So I uh, you know, I was out today and was pretty physically active um, this afternoon. So it's like, it would be good to make steak for dinner. It's a Friday. And at least in the Byzantine world, we at least, you know, even in our minimalism in the Ruthenian church, uh, by what's required strictly, we don't have meat. We don't have meat like that today. So I could say it would be good to have a steak. But I can't. But of course, I can't choose to do that. That's a velity, it would be called, or velaity, as some would say. It's a an open wish that I can't actually do. Now, sometimes you could think, too, I would like to have, you know, a million dollars. I'd like to have a full basement to my house that's not a crawl space, but I'm not going to get that, right? I mean, I guess I technically could, but it'd be so expensive, it wouldn't be worth that. They ain't going to get it. That's a velity or a velity. It's a simple wish. That's how people talk about that. That's different than an intention. I intend to have my sill plate fixed because of the termite damage. I know I keep talking about the termite damage, but it takes a long time to get all your contractors in line and it's a lot of steps and it's on my mind a lot. So I can intend that. I can follow up with the framing contractors who are doing a bid for me. I can do that action. That's an intention. It's efficacious. It's possible. Okay, that's a normal way this is presented and has some truth to it and we should keep it in the back of our mind. But I want to present it a little bit differently. Each of these stages these big three of the three, and especially the first group, the order of intention and the order of choice. This is very much the case. uh, Clearly there is 
a set of intellectual acts and a set of volitional acts involved. Apprehension and will, and they actually play off of each other a lot. Our, our intellect and will, it gets increasingly interwoven because actually our will, our love, which is, is actually made right through virtue, has to lead us to make the right choice. And so slowly but surely, by the will's own love, by the spiritual appetite's own love, and even by our passions being rectified by the virtues, helping us as instruments to love what is truly virtuous, we internalize and become the agents of the good that we apprehend. Intellect and will interplay a lot here. So always remember that when we're, we're presenting them as separate, because they are different. To know is to know and to will is to will, but there's an intercausality very important, very important. It's utterly traditional Thomism, but they cause each other in different genera of causality, we'll say. Okay. It's best to think of our first apprehension of the, of the good as a moral apprehension of moral truths. Now, some people may think I sound like the new natural theologians when I say this. People like Germaine Grise or Finnis or even Robert George, but I'm not quite them. But I, you know, I do see what they're in a Thomist frame, a very Thomist framework. I see what they're getting at. You have to see, for example, so, um, you know, let's take, take as uh, an instance. You know, it's good to be self, to be, um, they would use this example that's there, the blasted house, I guess. Um, it's good to not um, avoid things that need to be fixed whenever you own property, especially if you've got a family, especially if you could put someone else at danger, it's good to confront issues and, and work to fix them for the sake of other people to be, we could say deep down inside, you could look at this as it's good to play the role of the paternal and, um, and male figure of the house, right? Let's not throw me under the bus for being some chauvinist. I'm not trying to be, but I'm saying to be the husband and and father of the house. That's a good. And you know, when we watch when we watch good movies, when we read good literature, we 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 can experience this good, not because we think right now we have to do something, but we see someone else doing something good and it brings tears to our eyes. So maybe I'll use a different example. So boy, Michael, I, I'd love to, I don't have to turn the screen, but I'd love to see what your face is going to be like here because you're going to like not expect my example. The the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band in the 1970s did <laughs> a recording, a set of recordings down in Nashville uh, of old timey bluegrass and country music. But they were, you know, younger artists and they kind of just set up shop in Nashville. And they, uh, they're doing their recordings, and eventually some of the old-timers come. Some came earlier, some came later. You know, So Mother Maybell Carter comes. O old Roy Acuff comes, the guy who did the, the um, uh, you know, Grand Ole Opry for decades. Uh, and Acuff for a while was kind of like, who are these, you know, these long-haired youngsters? But part of the album that they did, I think it was 1971, 72, right? You're in the midst of the, the turmo turmoil that had been caused by the Vietnam War. And the, the, the way that it broke up the generations, right? The elderly and the, the youths, right? So you have families that are feuding with each other over the war. Um, and so people who like the, the who like country, classical country music are going to tend to be more conservative. Um, and then these youths with their long hair, these anti-war hippies. Well, ACOM eventually comes and they do, a, they do a recording of a number of the old songs, actually, the classics. But among them, they do, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? You know, a lot of people know it because of that. They don't know it as an old, it's basically an old African-American spiritual, actually. Um, but it was first the Carter family really made it known in the country music world. Um, but so you've got these old timers and these young, you know, long haired, very talented musicians singing and playing together. And there's a point at which Acuff, he always had this kind of like, schmaltzy showmanship right on on the uh uh, uh what do you call it? on the on the opry and he'd, he'd say you know take it so and so you know sort of they, they they were adapting this from certain veins that were entering into country music and then he would 
sort of started doing that and I, uh, if you were in a big band or something. So he says, take it so-and-so. I don't even know who it was. who was taking a solo after he was singing one of the verses. And it made me cry. So this is the point of the story. It, it brought tears to my eyes. I was listening to it um, oh, just a couple days ago. I forget where I was driving and I had it on. I was going up to my in-laws. Um, uh, I was in a separate car for my wife. And uh, I just started crying. Why? Because not just because of like my mental problems and my instability, but because I saw the beauty of the idea of the symbolism of one generation being able to hand stuff on to another. That to me is an example of what wish and simple willing, or whatever we want to call it, would be. Or the judgment and wish is maybe the better way to put it, because wish is usually attached to the act of will. So we can see that that's a true good when it should be done. I'm not going to do it right now, you know, but it's a true good and it should be able to be appreciated in itself, even if I can't do it right now. That's the, the whole birth of moral agency comes from that, that apprehension and that willing. Everything else will spill from that because if you can't see that, you won't do it yourself. You won't even intend to do it. Road to, road to hell is paved with good intentions. Can't even intend. You can't even start the road to hell if you can't even see that it's good and just wish that, that it be done if it could be done. Simple apprehension and wish. Now, if we want to be, you know, dusty and dry scholastics, how do we, what is the intellectual habitus for that uh, kind of apprehension? What is the intellectual virtue that enables that? That is what gets to be called syndericis, or the grasp of first principles in the moral order. Uh, it's the ability to see, normally the example is used, the good must be done and evil must be avoided. That's like the principle of non-contradiction, but for moral action. It's the basic moral insight. All the virtues, all the virtues have insights like that. So we could just say, for example, that, you know, generational comity is necessary or, you know, generational, generational interaction uh, that is in, in line with reason is necessary. That's a really vague background virtue that's somewhere hanging around in the, in the tree of justice because it's about our relationships with other people. And that's, a, I would say, probably a gr something that you grasp through syndesis. There has been work done on this, not a lot of people talk about how Sindaricis enables us to see the ends of the moral virtues. Um, St. Thomas himself says it, but one of the reasons that people don't see it is because it's mixed out through all of his works. And I had the blessing of having to somewhat learn my Thomism backwards. And so I found all of these themes without kind of just getting lost in saying the good must be done and evil avoided. The good must be done and evil avoided. There's a lot more that goes on with Sindaricis. It's the ability of mind naturally had, but we can develop it to grasp first principles of the moral order. But that needs to be perfected by willing, loving, appreciating, we could say, those goods. Now, there's an issue here. Big issue. Huge issue. An issue that's so large that Thomas don't talk about it. It makes me angry and I stick many footnotes in articles in my technical articles that I write as a scholar about this, sometimes even just like when it's like half related. You also need, of course, for the Christian virtues, faith to be involved. Simple, we know that. But somehow, faith also is going to play the same role as Sindaricis here. Not a lot of discussion of this. You'll find in certain Thomas, though, um, before the deluge that was the 1960s, um, that it, it will be attributed to faith. So by faith, we grasp the, the, the ends of the Christian moral life. Um, you know, we, we grasp our divinization. We grasp the, those sorts of acts that would be in line with that life. And it plays the role of first principles. Certain people like Father uh, Merkelbach would have um, faith and syndesis. Faith would use syndesis as an instrument. I used to kind of think that was correct because he was the first person I ever saw this in. And it was really, really interesting. I'm not so sure. But we can at least say that Christian moral virtue, as well as actually the theological virtues and acts of the theological virtues. But boy, 
all of what we're talking about today gets really difficult. So we're going to stay in the domain of moral virtues um, for the most part. But it's important to know that Thomism can handle this other stuff. Um, the the uh, the virtues of theological virtue of faith and Sendarisis are there at the beginning at the heading, working together somehow to enable us to see what our moral vocation is, what moral values are, we could say. Um, and then we have to have the character to have incipient virtue to be able to love those ends. But that's only incipient, right? I can't right now. I'm not at the place to have to hand things on to the next generation. But God willing, whenever I'm 55, 60, I hope that I'm starting to move toward retirement. Um, not because I don't want to work. I mean, I hope to stay very vigorous, you know, uh, maybe even shaking my fist on occasion at the world. But retirement in the sense that I need to hand things on to the next generation. You know, I'm hoping that I have the efficacious capacity to do that. I need to be ready. And so we'll come back to the other example now. I have to be ready here and now. And boy, this is quite real for me to choose or not choose yet to intend to choose to be a good husband and a good father to make sure that, you know, this side of the house doesn't sink. Um, and, you know, that other such attendant things get done in my crawl space to deal with the discovered termite damage from a few months ago. So I move from merely seeing that it's good to be a good father and a good husband to intending an act that will express that. I'm going to do that. I'm in the midst of trying to make choices to do that, right? I've, I've had a carpenter over to deal with these, this part. And I'm going to have to carpenter over to deal with this and have waterproofers over to deal with this. So I have to, though, intend. I have to stretch out toward a potentially achievable good. And that's the mark of intention, right? We tend to talk about, oh, good intentions. And, you, you, you know, someone has good intentions, but they never do it. Well, okay, they may have an intention and they fail to judge and choose what they need to do. They're going to fail on that second part of our chart. Or they may never have intended this. Intention really means ultimately, and it fails if this is not the case, it means I stretch out my being toward an end to be achieved, but I got to achieve it. And so in order to do that, I need the virtue of prudence. So you, you kind of pull back because you're like, oh my gosh, I still have so much to do. But I still start. I start. And how do I start? It's because I, now this is the whole issue. I have the virtue already. Problem is good acts build up the virtues, but I need the virtues in order to do the good act. So it's like this. You have a weak virtue. You do a good act. You get a stronger virtue. Your virtue grows because you, you have you've in a way made yourself with the concurrence of God as first cause more virtuous, or you've merited an increase in the virtues. If we're talking about the infused virtues, let's set that aside. But from a, an analytic perspective, we can say we at least have some degree of virtue, even if it's the most incipient little bit that's there because of the spark of our will that is inclined toward the good. And this is the way that we can convert and get out of vice. We have to intend ourselves, stretch forth toward an end. But that end, that virtuous end, is going to measure our activity because now it is the goal that we must achieve. So, of course, the goal of being a good father, for instance, doesn't include, you know, uh, murdering people and stacking their skulls up from the sill plate to my subfloor so that I can, you know, buttress my, my house up and keep it up like that. There we go. I apologize. My video kind of went out. Um, I can't murder people and stick their heads up from my sill plate, my foundation top to my subfloor. And say that that is being virtu a virtuous husband. To be, to be a just and virtuous husband and father includes sticking to the order of the virtues. But I have a lot of different ways I can do it. A lot of different ways. You know, in a different world if we were going to move, which we're not going to. But if we were going to move, that would be the choice by which to, 
to you know best provide for the family and to deal with this issue and to basically bite the cost whenever you sell the house. I mean, we can come up with many different ways, um, all the different ways of finding contractors and whatnot. But having that virtuous end, figuring out how to deploy our finances and what that's going to mean for the next next year will all come into this decision. But we're just stretching out. The end is what will measure the moral truth of our action. That does not mean that choices are subjective, because ultimately the measure of our moral action is found in the virtues, which actually are ultimately measured by our beatitude. But the reality that ultimately measures our activity are the virtuous ends. But the virtuous end that we intend becomes the measure for the next step. That is choosing your action, choosing your choice, or really your actions, right? So this is this whole blast project has required just a whole series of actions. This is why you actually end up with sub-intended ends within your big intention scheme. But hopefully the, the one big act that's spread out over multiple months is the act of being a providing uh, husband and, and uh, father, you know, at least in these kind of, this part of the domestic duties. Very important to see here, though, what's happening. And I'll only hint at it, but moral truth is very different than speculative truth. We tend to think of truth like speculative truth. Is my mind, is my idea, above all, is my judgment in line with reality? Humans are political animals. Yes, indeed, they are. Um, that's, that is in, in, in line with what the reality of human nature is. But to say... Having that contractor from up there do this work is a uh, an act that is, um, you know, whatever, husband justice, fatherly justice, paternal justice. Um, that is in part measured by my own circumstances and the end itself intended. Does it direct me to the end or not? Now, the ends do not justify the means, and we can only talk about that a teeny bit in a lecture like this. I assure you that the Thomist would never say the end justifies the means. Um, and I tend to, to hyper, in, I'm hyper, um, uh, influ I, I have, uh, I apologize. I hyper emphasize the role of the end in moral reasoning, but you have to. You have to be careful because it has some dangers to it. But moral reasoning asks, is the act in conformity with a virtuous end? not is the act in conformity with reality. Now, ultimately, it needs to be in conformity with reality because the virtuous end is conformed to reality, the reality of human agency and the agency of a, of a divinized child of God. But practical truth is a truth that uh, a truth of direction. It directs us to virtuous ends versus a truth by adequation, which is truth of the speculative intellect. This is the great insight. It's in St. Thomas. It's in Aristotle. Um, it's developed with just great clarity, like, like the, the cutting of the most perfect and most beautiful of gemstones by Cardinal Thomas de Vio Cajetan. Um, and it's one of the great gifts of the Thomas school that's, you know, thrown overboard after the council because, you know, why do we have to listen to anyone who's, you know, after Thomas? So there's my bitterness coming through, though. Anyway, got to choose the, the path to take. So we've gone from velity, or we've gone from wishing, or we could say admiring, with the depths of our moral heart, a, a moral good, and intending it, but now the intention must bud forth in an action. So we have to take counsel. We have to judge what we're going to do, and then ultimately we have to do it. We have to execute. Those three major stages are the stages of prudence. Prudence is an interesting virtue. It's got lots of uh, sub-virtues attached to it. I have this tree that I made for, for teaching where I went through one of the texts where Thomas lays it all out. And so you've got all of these various sub-virtues that are attached. You have to have a virtuous memory and that you have to be docile and that you have to have your own insight into your actions. Um, you have to basically have caution because you have to see that there are evils involved in the world. Because guess what? We aren't Pharisees. 
we don't get to to wipe our hands of dealing with the evils of the world as Christians, right? That's the the meaning of Christ eating eating with uh, sinners. That's one of the many meanings. He goes to convert them. Yes, he tells them to sin and go no more. But Christ had attacked for going and being with these people and not falling into sin. You got to have that if you're going to especially be a Christian with Christian prudence. You need all of these tools to do prudential reasoning. But the stages are pretty common sense. And St. Thomas gets this from Aristotle. I think it's just so commonsensical. It's just part of the common heritage of, you know, sane philosophers and theologians, in my opinion, that you have to you have to deliberate. What are you going to do? You have to take counsel. What am I going to do? You have to talk to people who, who know better than you. I've had multiple conversations with my my dear uh, uncle, uh, who's who's very good at doing home improvement projects about what in the world should I do with an entire sill plate that's on the side of the house that's not even under any joists because it's on it's running parallel to my joists. Oh, what do I do with that? And then, you know, what do you think about what I'm going to have done with this other section of the sill plate that had water damage? You know, and so we had lots of conversations and we were visiting them. We all take very high COVID precautions. So it was like the touching of two circles that, that don't get out too much. So no scandal to be caused there. Um, and while everyone else was in the other room, not very many people, my, my wife, my kids, and my aunt, um, and maybe a cousin of mine who works from home, uh, he and I are there sketching everything out. I'm taking counsel. I'm taking counsel about like what makes sense and like how am I not going to waste money? I don't want to get bamboozled by someone on this, right? I can do enough. I can do just enough home improvement wise to be dangerous. So, you know, I need to make sure that I know what I, what I need to have done. All of this is part of the deliberation process. And, you know, if I was a, if I was overly fearful and it's it's tempting to get there, I would be like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I don't know who to trust. And I don't know who to call. And you know what? The house house really hasn't sunk. That that section has been bad. And this one really is actually you can't even you can't see it yet. So, like, what, why, why do anything? That's a sin against good counsel. Actually, there's even a separate virtue assigned to it by Aristotle and St. Thomas called Eubulia to take good counsel. Um, but that kind of delaying of, of a decision because you can't get off the pot instead of going to the bathroom would be a fault. So the virtuous person who's who's got decent prudence is going to come to a judgment eventually. You're going to make little sub-judgments of possible paths, and these, these are called judgments of counsel. Sometimes they're said to be judgments in globo, in broad brush. Not totally, not totally attached to me here. I got to weigh more things out. I have to, I have to existentialize these decisions. I have to make them mine. But eventually, you're like, okay, this is the path I'm going to take. And guess what? There could be another, technically, another contractor or someone else you end up going with after you do all of your bidding. You've done due diligence. This is where the whole discussion of antecedent conscience comes in. You know, did you did you know that something was wrong ahead of time and then do it or not? You've done everything you can do within your power and you make a choice. And guess what? You could have you could have made the other choice. You could have made a different choice had you slightly weighed things differently. Or maybe it was almost equal. There wasn't much danger and you decide I'm going to go this way. I'm going with this contractor on these dates or whatever the issue. I'm just using this one example because it develops it for us. I mean, this applies to anything. But if indeed that is in line, truly in line with the nexus of virtues, primarily the virtue in this case of paternal and, and uh, spousal justice, if that decision truly is in line with it, and then the overall nexus that gives it its context, so that, you know, for instance, you can't go murdering people to stack their skulls up to fix this. If it's truly in line, that was the virtuous choice. Who we are matters a lot. Our circumstances matter immensely to whether or not our judgment is uh, is correct. Our disposition matters a lot. That doesn't mean that, that our feelings make for morality. But ultimately, it's only the person who has the virtue of prudence. And that also means the person who has a prudent will and not just a prudent mind will come to that decision. Very often, St. Thomas is presented 
as though he's a, a very cold intellectualist about moral agency, as though the mind goes along, I come to my final judgment, and it tells the will. I say, make this choice, and the will follows. That's true. That's true from the perspective of formal causality. The intellect is the formal cause, the extrinsic formal cause of the will by its command above all, but also by its judgment, but above all by, by then, by its command. But the, the judgment is there too. I make this final judgment. I screw up my will, but no particular good. And now we feel the treatise of beatitude coming back. I don't know why I'm pointing back here, but somewhere back here must be the treatise on beatitude. It is in these volumes. The treatise on beatitude comes back now and, and settles on us because no particular choice will ever slake our desire for, for the good, but our desire for God. Nothing will ever slake that infinite thirst that we have. And therefore, it takes a virtuous will rectified in the order of ends by the moral virtues in the order of means by the moral virtue of prudence to make this choice. Why was this choice right? Because it was truly virtuous. It was in line with virtue and it was the kind of decision that the prudent man in these circumstances would make. There's a real sense in which we make moral truth, but it's a moral truth that's ultimately grounded on reality because of the reality of the virtues and how they're related to our beatitude and happiness. You could say how they're related to the natural law and founded on the eternal law, but that's a little bit too textbook and it makes it sound, you know, a, a little bit too rote. But it's an amazing fact of how the intellect and the will, especially here, you can never stop this. The intellect could forever come up with new paths because we could find all sorts of other things that would be desirable because guess what? Every being every possible action, which is a kind of being, is good in some way. And since it's good in some way, we can present it to ourselves as an option. But the virtuous will eventually says, no, now is the time to act and this is what to do. And then intellect and will, mind and heart, meet in an embrace. And then that spills out because you now have chosen what to do, but it has to spill out into action and you have to do what you're going to do the actual activity. And that's the stage of execution. The stage of execution or command is the full fruition of, of moral virtue. The way you can tell this is that the person who doesn't do, who chooses not to do the moral act, is, is imputed to be, uh, to be at fault. Or maybe another way to put it even, even better is, person who chooses to do the opposite of the moral act at that last minute, we say, well, that person failed. They had good intentions. They even judged the right path forward, but they had a weakness of will. Interestingly, that's different than the case of art, for example. This is the classic example the Thomists use. Um, the person who has skill at an art, a fine art, for example, knows how to make a mistake very well. Right. If you're teaching someone how to play an instrument, for example, you you are able to tell tell them how to make a, a good mistake because it's here's a mistake and here's how to fix it. You know the kind of mistakes that can be made. It's like my organ instructor whenever I was in the monastery. He got very mad. I, I heard his watch and I couldn't get rid of it. And he got kind of angry um, and he 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 was an artist, you know, and uh, he said, you know what? You're going to have to listen to this, you know, so and so and so and so and so and so singing at different paces. How are you ever going to play a hymn for all of them? And so he went and he started to show me how to compensate for all of that and how they can lead you astray, right? So Father so and so is going to lead you fast and here's what's going to happen, but here's how you pull it back. Ah, knowing how to make a good mistake makes for a good artist. The person who knows logic really well can pick out and tell you a logical fallacy really well. But the moral person, if that person does it volitionally, chooses to do the wrong thing, they failed. Freedom has failed. And so is the moral action. And so we've got to get down to the command of the action. It has to spill out over all of our 
soul, basically, all of our faculties, right? We have to deploy our memory to, to help us find the path forward. There actually are little sub virtues like caution that are involved here because I can judge what to do, but as I'm doing the action, I run into things that might be wrong and I have to find a way between evils to do the right thing. And who but Christ had the best view of that and who should we pray to? to have the best view for that, especially as Christians. And then ultimately, though, at the end of all of this, the command, the execution of the act, both actively and passively in all of our, our faculties of soul and body as well, because our moral countenance should be visible on our very countenance, that it should spill out over all of our body. But ultimately, something should take us back to the good old days of the top of that chart. Because at the very beginning of this, we appreciated this moral good. We took joy in this moral good. And now we get to the end. And whenever we do the act, we fully enjoy while we're doing the act. It's the moral equivalent of being in the groove whenever you're playing a musical instrument or whenever you're a skier, whenever you really just are, you know, I mean, I'm just sort of like a so-so skier, but there are times where it feels just right as you're going down a real fast hill. And it's just for a moment, you step out of time because you've touched act. This is a true case of not kinesis, as Aristotle would say. This is not motion that's happening here, folks. There ain't no potency going to go into act here. There's just act that is blooming. And you morally experience what it's like to be actualized in the order of moral existence. And all you can say in a sense is, oh, Lord, it is good to be here. You take joy in it because now your will is not executing. It is, I guess, because you're still finishing your task but your will is not considered as executing. Your will is also resting in the joy, that, in, the, in the good that you were doing. It's not just a question of like, oh, I'm done. I did the act. I take joy in that act. That's how it's normally proposed. Joy in the accomplished act. I like to think of it in the act that is occurring. You have a joy that, John St. Thomas notes this actually, a joy that began at the beginning of the act as you're working to intend it, because your, your heart already saw that this was a good act to do. And here at the end, you find yourself, you know, in the midst of the act, feeling the rest, the sense of it is just good humanly as a child of God to be doing this. Then we've made it to step 12 of that 12 step chart. I suppose I should say something, though, in passing, although rhetorically, I just want to stop there. I just want to stop there, and that's where it should end. But I should I should make sure I point out something very important here about the Treatise on Human Acts. Um, the, the end, the last couple questions uh, in St. Thomas's Treatise, after dealing with what the Thomists usually would say is the psychology of moral acts. So it's more about, like, what is the, the psychological mechanisms that are involved in coming to a moral act. Um, in essay uh, physico, as, as would be said by the later scholastics. Well, then there's in essay morale. You've got to discuss moral objects. Um, and this is a whole other interesting discussion about the relationship between physical objects and moral objects. People messing around with this gave birth to like the positions of, of certain um, uh, consequentialists in the Catholic Church. The idea of like, if you ever heard about pre-moral acts, it's related to people kind of uh, misapplying some of this stuff. But the, the object of an act is basically its quiddity, its essence, its whatness. Um, what is it that you did? It's essential character. The object of an act is essentially what you have chosen. Now, most foundationally, that is related to the end that's intended, even though there's a distinction between them. Because for example, what I did in a wrong act is I stacked up skulls from the, you know, the bottom of my footer all the way up to my subfloor, if I were to do that. Of course, that'd be a really bad plan because the skulls would crack, but you get the point. Um, 
that is a sinful act that, yes, it had an end that was semi-virtuous but failed. So that's like better than I was just murdering out of cold blood. So it had a circumstance that made it less bad. Um, but in the end, the act is actually an act of the, the vice of murder. It's kind of injustice. The object of an act should always be named after a virtue or a vice if it's a sin. It is an act of what of some virtue or vice. What part of the soul did it emanate from? So if I did that horrible act, you know, it would be there is some emanation in my soul in the midst of me trying to do something just. I give in to my rage about, you know, I kill a whole slew of scotists and I use their heads. Well, uh, the, the, the vicious part of my soul has flared up and has given birth to an act of, uh, of murder, um, multiple acts of murder, in fact. Um, but the act's object, above all, is its, is its essential character. And everything else is technically, even, even its end, can be considered a circumstance, but it's also the most important circumstance. A circumstance of an act is something that is morally important, that's related to the chosen act and the freedom being exercised, that changes the act, but in a way that doesn't change the essential character of the act. It makes it better, it makes it less good, it makes it worse, it makes it less bad. It's a you know, mitigating circumstance, but it's a, it's a, a non-essential attribute of the moral act. Technically, moral acts can actually have multiple spe moral species involved in them because you can have multiple moral um, qualifications to an act. Um, so, you know, you could, you could at once, you know, I could... Uh, how to put it, you could make, you could, you could make a meal to provide for a sick relative. Um, but you also choose, um, you know, to do something or how to put, you could make a meal for yourself, but also to provide for a sick relative. So you're going to have your own dinner and you could say it's a virtuous act of providing for yourself, but you're also, kind of more deeply intending, or maybe your choice is actually, you're intending to feed yourself, but you're also choosing to do it in a way that helps someone else. So by choosing to do it in a way that helps someone else, you have two things going on there. You virtuously are, prepared, are providing for your own health, but you also are providing for someone else. That act is more about your yourself than about the kindness in this case, because you're primarily intending it for your own good. You could flip that intention, of course, and then in that case, you would intend the end of providing for them and choose to do it through your own meal, in which case that act would be more the intended end uh, of helping them, but also would have the character of providing for yourself. But, you know, you have to be very careful whenever you start talking about this because you'll start making up different species all over the place. Um, so I had to at least touch on that at the end because it's there. It's very important to the analysis of moral acts, the, the whole discussion of um, objects and circumstances. Some of the older texts are, are better on this than, than newer ones, although they're ones that are in, very intelligent um, on moral agency. But uh, there's a really good section on this in Garagu's Beatitude text, but it's never been translated correctly because that Beatitude text is uh, a paraphrase in English right now. So the the edition in Latin has has a whole good sub subsection on conscience that, that discusses this. But I had this rhetorical ability to get to the joy that we take in in an act, and it would have been such a beautiful place to end. And instead, Michael, I think it's time for us just to end right here. Not a problem. We do have some questions here in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, what does Dr. Monder think of Ed Fazer's essay on the perverted faculty argument pertaining to sexual morality? Yeah, and it's been a little while since I've read his because this does come up as a as a discussion point. The um, so I I forget his exact argument, but I tend to think there's a real danger. I he I think sometimes Ed Fazer uh, might be a teeny bit different for me on this. Um, you know, he was very kind and he did a, a, a recommendation for one of my books. So I don't want to be unkind, of course, but I, I tend away from physicalistic explanations in this, right? Anything that's going to smack of the idea of merely using the physical teleology of 
uh, you know, in this case, the sexual organ, merely that um, is going to just give me a little bit of pause. I like to I like to kind of split the difference between that and the new natural law people. I think that they tend toward a kind of Kantianism. But I like to say that the kind of virtuous chaste activity of sexuality involves some understanding of our sexual dimorphism and hence requires as part of its natural constitutive factors, you know, sexual dimorphic relationships. Um, this is expressed in the dimorphism of our, our, our physical makeup. Um, but it's not merely the physical act of, of sexual intercourse that's going on here, but it's rational measured um, sexual intercourse, which has taken our animality and has then developed it. Um, so it's it's just a it's just a sh shade different. Like there's Father Cadget and Cuddy and I were talking once. If you had Kant, maybe some other people, the New Natural Law people, and then um, Stephen Long and 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 oh, uh, what's his name? Or, or Jensen, um, Stephen Jensen, on this this whole spectrum from internalist, intentionalist, all the way to kind of naturalist, physicalist. And I would say Phaser is somewhere around Steve Long there on that. I'm, I'm like, and then somewhere near the middle, but slightly toward Kant is Martin Ronheimer. I'm between Ronheimer and Long. So. Sorry about that. I was on mute. The next one here is um, from Justin. Dr. Monner, may you please try to re relate this talk to the subject of the controversy of more satitia and also replace the analogy of the term I house. <laughs> Uh, now, may I make a may I make a point, Justin? It's not me trying to be self-referential. It's because it's re it's it's the thing that's real to me. I mean, the problem is I don't want to come up with like a, the simple like a simple simple case, right? This is something that's like morally been tearing me apart of late. Um, so I'm, I apologize if it's a little bit tedious. Um, yeah, I uh, yeah the the issue you're thinking of is that footnote, of course, in the Morris Letizia. Um, Let's, okay, fine. I will do this as a Thomist. So the problem of people living together or the question of people living together as brother and sister is a great example of how there are circumstances in which you can, you can have what would be a virtue. It would be virtuous activity that I have, you know, my, I come from a divorced family. So my biological father um, was a mess by the time I was three years old. Um, but let's, you know, after that, I can't make much more judgment because there's no need for me to play out my family. So now we're going to go into a, a kind of scenario based on that. It's made up. If, um, you know, eventually my mother and she gets married, has, has um, you know, a child and, you know, the family kind of family unit kind of keeps going, going along, but they have a conversion and they say, you know, we, we want to practice again as, as Catholics. Um, but there's my you know, father's just a, you know this didn't happen. He actually got quite a bit better, but he was an out, let's say he's a continued alcoholic mess. And so it would be a danger for me as, as a young man, let's say that maybe I was nine years old at the time to be involved. And you're going to have a problem with the child, the second marriage. And you make, you know, you make a true and a true and firm commitment to, to live as brother and sister. That's an act that can be a completely virtuous act because you've created the circumstances in which you're not going to you're not going to tempt each other into sexual intercourse and you still got a long time that you're going to have to raise these two children. Um, and you're not going to publicly present yourself as, um, you know, as spouses. And there has to be a way that that's recognized. So I think it's important to figure out, I'm not saying that that's a ceremony that you're recognizing. I'm saying there's a way that it's recognized. That the church is not teaching this just as a kind of covert marriage. Um, that there is something where you can make a choice and it takes an immense amount of virtue, actually. Now, I'm not, you know, a lot of people aren't aimed for this because that's why most people just say to hell with it. I'm not doing that. It takes an immense amount of virtue. Say, I'm going to abstain really for, probably for the rest of my life from sexual activity. Um, and I'm going to also like make this a very difficult relationship where we're, we're really not even functioning in an amorous way, the two of us. Um, but we are both devoted to the raising of these two children. I wish Pope Francis could have made that argument instead of the footnote argument, which made it sound like basically, uh, you know, you could transmute an evil act. Maybe it's, you know, let's be honest. You know why that mistake was made? Because a lot of post-conciliar theology and, and philosophy is lazy at times. And there's just a loss of loss of nuance. And I think they, they really stubbed their toe on that is what I think. Now I don't, you know, 
That's why we have a dubia that's never answered. The dubia should be able to address that. That's what you should do. Because you're not at all sanctioning a good action in that case. Right? You're not mm-hmm. sanctioning. Or bad action. I'm sorry. You're not sanctioning a. You're, you're not. Or you're not approving of a bad action in that. In the case that I laid out, you're actually approving of of like a really trying to find their way forward, um, prudent act. Yeah, I'm just frustrated. I get frustrated about like the dubia not being answered and whatnot. It just I forgot about it. I forget about it because it's been so long. <laughs> Several. The uh, Dubia Cardinal is already dead. I think what they're doing is they're just waiting for them all to die, and they're not going to respond to them. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. It's passive aggressive. It's you know don't don't talk to me about clericalism. This cler yeah. that's talk about uh, 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 about toxic clericalism. It makes me sad. <laughs> Here's uh, one from Five a Day. What are the differences between Bonaventure's conceptions of virtues versus Aquinas and this? And is this affected by his view of cosmic exemplarism? Cos- exemplarism? I'm not familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, Whoa, no, I I can't answer even the virtues thing. I really would have to look at like the second book of the the sentences, and I'm just not a trained Bonaventurian guy, um, so I don't want to say anything. And I I don't know if it would be if you're talking about exemplarism, you know. There, there are interesting relationships between the idea of God as the exemplar cause of, of reality and St. Thomas's own position at St. Bonaventure's, but I apologize that I'm not prepared to, to answer that. There's uh, another one on here from Colin. Uh, can you do an, I don't know what that is, EL15, <laughs> whether probabilism is an appropriate moral method for us Catholics. I don't know what EL15 is. Help me out yeah. there. here's what i I can say is the church got to the line of of uh sanctioning probabilism but never did so it was always acceptable um and there are there are a number of manuals from the old days that have that have laid out principles of where probabilism is considered to be acceptable um i like i like the kind of mitigated probabiliarism that you find in someone like Reginald Baudouin, which who tries to take the Thomas probabiliarism and be an equiprobabilist. But to be honest, I find, I find that whole dis- discussion and, and set of analysis at once important and we need to unforget it. Um, and I do have a, a translation text that that's attempting sort of to do that, but it's also really dry and hard. So, but Probabilism was never fully condemned, just certain theses of the more lax probabilists. So some Dominicans will tell you that it was it was one of the 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 disasters that the papacy kind of I forget what happened, that it got caught up and then couldn't condemn the Jesuits uh, for their probabilism. But it was permitted. This one is from Mauricio. Uh, what do we make of the volunteers' criticism that the Thomas is, is way too abstract and not pra- practical? Yeah, Mauricio, and I'm not at all. Just so you know, I'm not. I'm not laying down at you at all. And this is a damn lie from the volunteerists. There is a lot of will in the in the Thomas position. Some Thomas, because because Saint Thomas gives um, primacy of place to the the intellect, um, as the, the we could say the faculty by which we grasp. The reality in question, because uh, this is going to play out in beatific vision. Above all, the the people tend to look at it and say, "Well, the intellect commands the will," and that makes it sound like the intellect is the agentive factor, is the acting factor in the order of efficient causality. It's clear. I think in Thomas's own texts, it's very clear. In many Thomas, including Garrigou, who's like Garrigou, is big on the role of the will in all of our practical judgments. Our will is necessary. And it has to be a virtuous will in order for us to come to our last practical judgment. Actually, it's a great essay at the end of the order of things. It's a wonderful essay at the end of the order of things. Um, And also to the essay on conscience in the order of things, the the book I translated by Garrigou. He talks about the mutual causality of intellect and will in the terminal judgment. It's actually involved in all those judgments in in moral reasoning. But above all, in the the last judgment before our command, the intellect proposes the good to be taken in the order of formal causality. It causes the will to have this formality, but the will must will 
the good to be chosen in the order of efficient causality. It, he actually just says it's it's a, it's a great mystery that's involved here, how intellect and will are actually mutually causing each other in this last act. And I, I, I get worked up because I remember Maritain says in his book on action or his essay on action that's in the book, Existence and the Existent, which is just a digest of Garrigou's treatment, not only in this text that I just said, but also in the second volume of God, his existence and his nature. He has a long section against Leibnizian uh, uh, necessary creation and other related things. Um, he, uh, Maritain has, has this great remark where he says in existence and the existent that Thomism is just, it becomes just as voluntarist as any voluntarist would be without getting rid of the intellect, however, in its prime, its primacy. Um, so this is where, you know, Scotists especially will push you on this and then they'll tell you that you're just being a Scotist when you're reading it. But no, this is in Thomas, very much developed in that school. Um, there's mutual causality of intellect and will here, different orders of causality though, formal causality and, and, uh, efficient causality. Uh, this one is from Hugh. Actual grace is not necessary for the performance of a morally good action. Um, this is from Ott. What is the basis for this? Sorry, that's just a little bit out of left field. Give me a second. Yeah. Um, just so, so it wasn't, I mean, not yeah. to dismiss it. Um, I'd have to, I had to go and look at the, I have to look at the context on that is all. Um, because if it's a nature, I don't know if it's a nature issue because you're not going to need if that's saying if it's saying the actual grace is not necessary for for performing a naturally virtuous act because those aren't actually graced. Those are those are they've got a, a pre motion in the natural order. Um, I'd have to pull my copy of Odd off the shelf. I'm I deep I'm deeply apologetic. I know that I'm going to have something. I'm I'm here by myself tonight while my wife is out with the the kids. So I'll be looking at that you for you. This one is from Justin. Uh, looking ahead to the second part of the second part, it seems that Thomas says it is unjust to take interest on money and gives good reason. Do you have any thoughts on this? Nope, because that's such a that's such a horrible territory. I mean, I, I I have hesitations, Justin. I have hesitations, Justin, and I look at the way that economies become when money begets whenever um you know, when money begets money, you know, it's that, that old Aristotelian adage that it's like the most unnatural of things, um, you know, and uh, you could make some arguments about the nature of growth of economies and, you know, basically the inflationary pressures that are involved with that to try and talk yourself out of it. I've, I really am at a place where I don't feel um, convinced on this. This is why I wish we, you know, I wish you could find someone who's really good to talk about this. Um, so I apologize that I don't have an immediate usury answer for you. Um, so I, I basically live, I live in the world of a little bit of what's acceptable today. And that's, I know that sounds strange for people, but it's just not, right? it's an, there's an immense amount of economic theory that goes into that. And I, I don't feel like I could, could avoid getting bamboozled. So I really, am, I'm the kind of person who just doesn't, I don't like to take a hard stance on something if I'm, if I feel that I'm uncertain. So no problem. Yeah. And, and I don't see any others. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and call it there. Now, um, the next lecture that you're going to be doing, is it also, is it still on the first part of the second part or? Moving yeah. To, so, oh, okay. So first part, first part of the second part, we're going to do like a bit of treatment of the treatise on passions and it may be, a, who knows, a little bit shorter or not. I just want to do a general overview of the treatise on virtues because people just need to have, they need to make sure they understand all the different categorizations of virtue. So I'm going to do 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 pretty heavy on that section of the Soma so that people understand the distinctions between the acquired moral virtues and how they grow and the infused moral virtues and how they grow through merit, the theological virtues and their preeminence, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, what happens to the natural virtues when you're in a state of sin, et cetera. Excellent. I look forward to that. And that's going to be in two weeks. So same time, same bad place, as they say, same bad time, same bad place. <laughs> For those of us who are old enough to remember the old school Batman TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Which I imagine most of us are. Most of us yeah, are watching. Yeah, so, gray in my beard, gray in my beard. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> I remember watching it on. Uh, what was that deal where they showed retro 
uh tv shows i I don't even remember what it was but it was one of those channels that showed all of the old stuff was, you mean it was that, no this was years ago yeah, <laughs> back yeah. when people actually watched cable <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the problem i've got a whole period in a month between and, and, and those days so it's kind of like gone my memory <laughs> I wonder why people still some people still watch cable when you have you know live streaming and everything and on demand. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, you I know, know. So, it's easier for them to get the football games or something. I don't. Know. I guess so. I don't know, <laughs> but I don't want to get in trouble with the audience. So. Maybe there's still some utility for it. I don't know. Y'all let me know in the chat. Anyways, Doctor Miner, I appreciate you coming on. Look forward to the next one, everybody. Thank y'all for participating there in the chat. Don't forget to check us out at reasonintheology.com. Also, check us out at patreon.com forward slash reasonintheology. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this on your social media if you haven't already. Till next time, God bless you all.